and the making of the gay Asian community and oral history of pre-AIDS Los Angeles. He is working on a community memoir of the AIDS movement in the API communities in Los Angeles, for which he received a research fellowship from the One National Gay and Lesbian Archives in 2018. Please welcome to the stage Eric C. Watt. Thanks for being here. Um, I wrote a short story that I'm going to read. Um, I'm not going to read the whole thing, the excerpt. The title is taken from a Johnny Cash song. Um, P performed it in the prison, St. Quentin. Actually, the song was written by Shel Silverstein, but he first performed it in the prison. Um, the title is called A Boy Named Sue. I was supposed to be a boy. I'm the youngest of four, another daughter, or after already three. Before I came along, my family had already moved out of the overcrowded apartment in Chinatown. The economy was doing better, if only because both my parents had steady jobs. Three jobs, to be exact, between the two of them, plus some odd ones here and there. They found a house for rent in Highland Park, a four-bedroom at the corner of Marion of Marmion and Joy. Small bedrooms, but there were four, enough for each of my sisters to have their own room. Still close to Chinatown, but far enough from those morns, hidden behind restaurants and factories and village associations. Wider streets, more distance from the freeway, a standalone house, practically a suburb those days. They were feeling optimistic, so Pop wanted to try one more time for a boy. The luck ended there. He named me Susan. A year later, my mother fell ill and quickly died of a respiratory-related illness that her friend said she got from working in a garment factory. Their luck was fucked. In spite of all that, I had a happy childhood. Pop was overworked, so we, would, we could afford to stay in that house. Older sister worked part-time, too, at the McDonald's on Figueroa. She got the cooks to make extra burgers right before they closed that they were supposed to throw away at the end of the shift. That was our breakfast the next day. Second sister took care of me. I got to wear boys' clothes, hand me down from my cousins in the St. Diego Valley because they were closer in age to me than my third sister. I cut my hair when my neck could feel it, but I never did a good job. Second sister would fix it, and making it worse, she would just shave it all off. I rode my second-hand bike down the street in any of those little neat jerseys for my cousins, the scarred pile and the Chinese people in the neighborhood would call me child monk. When the boys played baseball in the street, I chased down the errant balls that they couldn't catch and threw them back as hard as I could. Needling the younger boys, their captain would say, get ready, Sue, I'm going to hit it so far that none of them can run it down. They loved me. I was supposed to be a boy. I was a boy. Um, and then he got, he got kicked out. I'm going to skip that part. Um, and he got asked back many, many years later for the first time to the house when the family was getting evicted um, because the landlord decided to sell the house. So they asked him to come back and pick up stuff that he wanted to keep. So this is that section. Um, so he's in this old room. A sister, my son. Second sister has stored boxes of my stuff in the co cobweb corner in the closet. In the first one, I find a series of proof sheets. I yell for my sister. She comes right away. What's the matter? I think this is yours. Hold on. She leaves the room only to return with a magnifying glass. A long time ago, she had taken up photography after a photojournalism class at LACC. She examines each frame on the first proof sheet. Yes, I took these, she says, astounded. Who else could it be? Older sister even bought her a Kodak with manual exposure that was even older than me. She moves over and down with the magnifying glass like a snake. Then she hands me the magnifying glass. But look who this is. I dive into the picture where she stopped. A boy was running down the pavement with a kite behind him, trying to get it to soar. His back to the camera, oblivious. I could tell by the street sign that read Mommy and Way that it was the end of our block. He was in the moment. He owned the street. The boy was me. I moved down the proof sheet, same shot, in consecutive moments. I was in motion. The kite rose, up, up, 
until eight, nine frames later, it disappeared. It's slowly coming back to me. The perfect lawn belonged to our neighbors, a gay couple. Double income, a long line of equity, and no kids, unless you consider them Pomeranian. <laughs> they say the gays come first and make the neighborhood tidy and safe for everyone else. Guess it's true, at least for the gays, not for queers like me. I ask, remember that couple next door who kept complaining about our fence? and they just gave up and eventually put up their own fence? What happened to them? Them, they sold as soon as we bounced back from the recession. They made a bundle. I think they're living in one of those high rises in Chinatown now. We both rolled our eyes at the same time, a small moment of solidarity. I'm definitely keeping these, they bring me joy. You were good at it, what happened? Cell phones, she says casually. But I know the truth, we happened. We all left her with our father, voluntarily or not. I buy dinner when brother-in-law comes home from work. I stroll down to Fidel's to pick up a pizza. At least Fidel's is still around. After dinner, I offer to stay overnight and to keep helping her sort things the next day. She's right. It's harder than I thought to leave the house. Thank you.